Hello. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I'm John Hofford. And, and hi, everyone. I'm Nicolas Rod. Yeah, we both work for uh, uh, Google. We are, well, I, I lead the team that delivers constraint layout and motion layout. Uh, and Nicholas used to lead the team. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just a guest for this one. <laughs> Yeah. So, yeah. and to give us a little bit of a uh, 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 kind of overview of sort of constraint layout and motion layout, um, we introduced it way back in 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 2016, um, uh, and we introduced motion layout in 2018. Um, it's it's about layout, and you'll see a lot of a lot of more about that during this talk. Um, and motion layout brings the animations and transitions. Um, and, and we also built a lot of the tools that you can use in Android Studio. Um, in 2021, we introduced Compose. And what we're gonna try and cover today is to kind of give you, uh, if you're used to our XML world, uh, kind of how to, how to think about our Compose world and how they relate to each other. And, and sort of a little bit of idea of, of where the strengths of Compose kind of transition you. Next. So I guess I can, I can start a little bit uh, with uh, why. Why would you be interested in constraint layout uh, in Compose? And, and I think like the, the main obvious, uh, like or more exactly, the, the obvious uh, answer to that would be, well, it's familiar, right? Like you, if you're used to create your layout with the concept that constraint layout uh, on the view system brings you, well, it's kind of convenient to be able to do the same uh, on, on in Compose as well. It also Kind of useful if you want to convert like a specific layout that you know maybe was complex to the compose world because those concepts that we're using here uh, for constraint layout are exactly the same, right? So, so it's kind of both like it's familiar and both it provides you a path uh, to compose if you want to go this way. So obviously, like the advantages of constraint layout lies or tend to lies in complex positioning. Uh, so if I if I go a little bit on that, right? There's often, we talked about relative positioning, um, but there's a bunch of other uh, things, right? But what's interesting with relative positioning is that you can look at a screen like, like this one that, that I'm showing on the right, and you know, at first glance, you're like, well, you know, that's probably something you could do with linear layouts. Um, and in the Compose world, that would be, that's probably something you could do with rows and columns, right? And that's true, right? After all, Everything can be done with, you know, the uh, simple, you know, rows or columns as long as you can nest them. And in Compose, this is much less a concern. If, in fact, not much of a concern at all uh, compared to what uh, you, what you had on the view world with linear layout, right? So go ahead and nest as much as you want, and you know it works pretty well. But if you go a little more in depth at, about this particular layout, what you look like, what it looks like is that. Even though it looks like it's something that could fit neat, nightly uh, in, a, in a grid pattern, it's actually not that straightforward. You see that actually those icons are actually vertically centered across themselves, you know, like they align themselves, uh, which means that they are not going to be correctly centered in their container, which means that you need to have padding, which means that you have to possibly compute it. So even something as simple as that, uh, you know, is is not automatically straightforward, right? And so the ability of uh, specifying your layout with actual relative positioning rules can become super handy. That being said, you know if if rows and columns works, and it, in a large majority of cases it actually works pretty well. Uh, for sure, you should you should use it, right? But construct layout, even in that world, you know, is pretty handy. Um, we also have like a bunch of additional uh, you know complex positioning rules that that can really Help you with complex, uh, complex resizing and complex layout. We also have this concept of helpers object, uh, like the typical one that is guideline, that really help to get closer to the design intent of your layout, right? And you know, at least in my perspective, is that if you have a design system, uh, if you have essentially like a system for your layout that is close to the design intent, it helps you build and maintain that layout, that screen. 
So the other aspect of it is that it's all declarative, right? And that's that's one of the big difference with uh, you know in, in in some sense with with Compose is that we we try to encapsulate a lot of complex uh, rules and behaviors in a declarative pattern, meaning that we don't really touch any logic, right? So it is purely at the declarative, purely at the presentation layer. Uh, and why would you want that? Well, it's it kind of give you like a nice separation of concern. Uh, and just a quick example, if you have a screen like this one, where it's clearly the same screen, but it's going to behave differently and lay, lay things out differently depending on the form factor, well, it's kind of nice to be able to put aside all the layout rules, all the presentation rules, uh, into their own little world and swap them depending uh, on the availability of the screen, for instance, right? Because that way your business logic doesn't have to change at all, right? So this kind of this advantage of, you know, you can encapsulate that particular behavior, that particular logic in its own little, you know, little world, uh, and you know it's not going to mess up with your actual business logic. Um, it's not something that you always want, but when, when you do, it's really handy. Uh, and finally, um, because we have this ability of, of you know, separating, splitting up that uh, UI behavior, that uh, layered behavior with the rest, it makes it really handy, uh, really easy to swap different roles, right? And if you can swap different roles for your layout, we can animate them, right? And that brings us with motion layout. Uh, so this is a quick example of the type of UI that nowadays people are expecting, right? We are not in 2010 anymore. People do want like animated uh, layouts, you know, layouts that really, or screens that morph into something else. So this is the type of expectation nowadays, right? And so the idea here is that what is it that we can provide to help you as a developer to kind of, um, you know, handle this complexity, this additional complexity. Um, so constraint layout today, uh, you can download it for Compose uh, in version 1.1 alpha 3. The way you use it is really straightforward, right? You literally create a constraint layout composable, um, put your composable inside it, tag them possibly with a reference. And here I'm just centering that button on screen, done. It's really, really straightforward. But we actually have different ways of expressing those rules. Um, so here's a quick example of a uh, relatively straightforward screen uh, in the view uh, world. Uh, and I have this welcome header text that is actually uh, centered uh, vertically. I have a guideline as well and a login button uh, position. And so this is what you would have in the XML world, right? You're probably very familiar uh, with uh, you know, the, the, this type of layout. And you see that all the rules are actually encoded in the XML, right? As well as the view declaration. So how does that look, this same screen, how does that look in Compose? Well, it's quite a lot simpler, in fact. So you see here that I have the same composable, the button, the text, all inside that constraint layout, and we have the same rules. Um, if I look at it, those are the composable that I'm positioning. Um, I have, as well, the constraints. and we know we follow the compose pattern where the the actual rule, the constraints that we're using in constraint layout are just passed as a modifier, and specifically here we pass them as a, as a Kotlin DSL uh, that uh, you know kind of let you express the different constraints. <clears throat> it's the same concept. It's the same way that we express the constraints in the view model. So if you are again if you are familiar with that, it's really a one to one mapping, but we use Kotlin DSL. Generally speaking, we're, we're trying to push as a, the Android toolkit like Kotlin first to really focus on having a great experience with Kotlin. And so that's one example where uh, you can easily express those constraints and take all the advantages of it being a DSL, integration in Studio, and et cetera. There's a couple of nice things that you, you may not see immediately. Um, one is, uh, so that those are the, the constraints. You create the references of the, the composable um, you need to be able to create references ahead of time because, of course, like the constraints are relative to one another, meaning that you know you might reference something that is not yet you know declared. So you create those references and then you can you know uh, manipulate them in the DSLs. But one one interesting thing is that guideline, right? In the view system, uh, a guideline, one of those helpers object, 
was just another view. In fact, it was kind of a fake view or was still a real view, but we are not exactly using it to display anything. We, we were simply using it in the XML a little bit to kind of walk around the, the XML parser and provide you this, this helper. But here, we don't, we don't have this XML problem, right? So in fact, we can just say that helper just becomes a virtual helper fully. There is no view associated in the Compose world. There is no composable associated to it. It's purely a virtual guideline. Right, and so that makes things a little tighter as well. So the the this kind of how it looks like with the you know the, the the DSL approach with constraint layout, but we have a different approach as well. You know, I mentioned earlier that oh yeah, one of the cool things that you can split apart the kind of the constraints, uh, the set of rules that you apply to your layout and the rest. Uh, if you have the constraints being directly as modifiers like that, well you don't really have this split, right? So we, we provide an alternative way of uh, setting up your screens with a constraint set, and that's just a standard object that you pass to constraint layout. And that actually you know, applies to those composable. And here you create a references, giving like, uh, those, those IDs, and you express the rest. The DSL is actually the same as the modifiers, right? So it's it's very it's it's very uh, it's very easy to switch from one approach to the other. It's the same way, you know. So it's still Kotlin, still DSL, and and you go with that. What's interesting is that we also explored an kind of an alternative approach, uh, and we, we talked about it in the past as well, uh, of representing this constraint set as a JSON five uh, object. Uh, JSON five is just a uh, a small tweak on JSON. What's very interesting is JSON is is like a standardized you know language, so it's all supported in Studio, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So why would we want to do that? We're going to cover that a little bit after. But it was just to show you a little bit the two different ways of uh, expressing or three different ways of expressing the constraint. An immediate advantage of using JSON here is that Live Literals and Live Edit in Studio works instantly. So you you see he. You see here that I'm modifying the JSON, and it reflects instantly in the Android uh, preview in Android Studio, right? So that makes like developing stuff uh, a little bit uh, easier and having a tighter uh, edit uh, cycle. And to kind of wrap up this section, this is a very <laughs> kind of like bird eye view of what's going on here. You see the whole declaration of your UI in XML on on the most left, uh, and you see the equivalent with the DSLs and the constraint set approach, both in DSL and JSON. You can see that essentially the Compose approach is quite a lot tighter. Uh, and you notice here that the constraint set is, is about the same. The reality here as well is that's a very simple example. Um, generally speaking, I, there is not a huge difference in practice between the three approaches uh, in Compose in terms of sizing. In fact, the constraint set might be a, often a little bit tighter as well. But that gives you a sense of, of your, where, where you are with Compose. Pretty much, it's a little bit easier to, to wrap uh, to wrap your head around and, and you know, to edit it by hand. Uh, and just, just for fun, that part I'm highlighting here is purely the constraint definition. So you can see a little more like the, the delta between XML, a little bit more verbose, and the constraint set approach. So that brings us to a limiting layout. Uh, in the view system, you might want to do something like that, right? We have, we have a single view here, and I'm using motion layout uh, in the view system, and I, I'm just like you know tweaking that in the motion scene. That's what you would typically see uh, when editing your, your layout in Android Studio with the motion editor. How to do that in Compose? It's actually pretty easy. So let me go through the example. We have, uh, first, I'm going to define two constraint sets. Uh, I'm just using JSON here because uh, it's handy, but you know it works exactly the same if I'm using the Kotlin DSL, it's the same stuff. So I'm defining those two constraint sets you know, with the two states of that animation. Uh, I'm actually building the objects just here. And here, you've got the little magic happen, happen just there. So pretty much, I'm just saying, I'm going to pick one of those two constraint sets depending on this variable, animate to end. If it's true, I pick the second one, if not, the first one. And I'm going to toggle the value of that variable when I press a button, just, just for the demo. And all I have to do in Constraint Layout to animate all of this is to set this animate changes equal true and to pass the, you know, the, the constraint set I picked. 
And then in, in the composable that I want to lay out, I just need to make sure that I have a layout ID that match the one I indicated into, in, the, in the DSL. And if I do that, it just works. So you can see that in a, in a very pretty expressive and kind of succinct way, I can, I can express quite complex uh, transitions between different states. John? Well, so uh, so that uh, what's happening in the background of that last demo is that constraint layout is actually calling motion layout to do its animation. So uh, so we're actually let's talk a little bit about what motion layout is if you haven't used it before. Um, essentially, you have states defined by constraint sets, like typically like a start and an end. You can define a transition. And the transition can be animated by a gesture, like a swipe or a button click, that kind of thing. And in fact, you can have many uh, states and many transitions, and they all can synchronize together, and you can do different things together. Next. So to kind of give, give you a real live instance, this is the calculator. <clears throat> and in fact, there are 10 different states to the calculator. And you can sort of see where my hand is swiping through a bunch of the different states when I swipe on it or when I click on the, the button to expand and collapse. Now, it has to handle these 10 different states and different transitions with subtle changes between them. And, and the whole thing has con uses constraint layout underneath because it has to handle a wide range of aspect ratios and things like that, and manage all the animation in a smooth fashion between all these different states. Oh, next. So kind of how that ends up looking in, the, in motion layout views is you have a, a layout file, and you have in your XML directory, you have a motion scene file. And the motion scene file will contain a collection of constraint sets and a collection of transitions. Next. Now in Compose, you can put the constraint sets up top, so you can put a collection of them, and then uh, transitions, and then you, you declare all your widgets, so all the, the, the views that need to be, uh, all the not views and composables to be moved. Uh, next. So let, let's look a little bit of, at, at what that looks like. Quick. Um, now, here you see a, a declaration uh, of a constraint set. Um, I'm using JSON 5 to, uh, to show the JSON 5 version, because in fact, that's the one that is the, the easiest to read, and, and it's the one that we're sort of leading with. We are also working on the DSL version. Um, I, 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 you can see it. So there is the end constraint set. There is a transition, and it, inside of a transition, it, you will have keyframes. In this case, you have a key position and a key attribute. Key position will modify the the, the path of of a movement, and key attributes can modify different kind of things, like do a, a sort of a visual a, a affine transform scaling in this particular case. Um, you also have key cycles, and, and in this particular case, you see a very complex waveform being generated there. Um, and to just to show you what the difference between the two of them would look like, this is the XML for the same exact key cycle on the other side. So you can see that, that in general, in Compose, we are achieving a much higher level of, of compaction of the API to make it fairly easier to read, understand, and, and sort of uh, think about what you're doing. So next. Um, one of the things that we, we also uh, now have is handling swipes. So this, in this particular case, you see uh, uh, on swipe. And it, the, the thing is, if you were to try and do this with, within Compose, by itself, you'd have to have a bunch of different, you have to sort of configure a swipe handle and all that stuff. 
here you just say, I need this object to swipe. Um, it's going to associate with a particular widget. Uh, um, you can say, treat it as a spring, and it'll, it'll provide a spring-like motion. Um, and there are a bunch of other options, like the, the mass and the stiffness and the dampening of the spring. And in fact, it, in the editor, you can change these things live. So you can say, oh, let me change the dampening a lot. And you see it kind of just damps to an end very smoothly. So, so one of the really nice things about uh, Compose uh, with the editor is that you can change things, you can interact with it, and it's relatively smooth. Um, another thing that, that, that motion layout is particularly good at is these complex uh, um, synchronized animations. In this particular case, I'm staggering a collection of widgets. And, and you don't, you're not doing a lot of complexity to, to declare that. You're just saying, oh, I need, I need it to be staggered in a particular pattern. I need it to move in, in arcs. In this case, it, it said, um, and you can, you can easily manipulate things and see their interaction from one uh, um, swipe to another. So it's, it's a very sort of dynamic way of programming <clears throat> what is a complicated, complicated uh, animation. Yeah, and, and you notice as well uh, in that preview that we are we're displaying the path uh, that the, each object is taking. So it's very easy to visualize the animation as well. And you notice as well that editing was live, modifying, and getting the feedback uh, in the preview was instant. Uh, so let me cover a little bit JSON 5. We talked about it a little. Just, just to kind of uh, set some expectations. So the the really nice thing from our perspective is that it provides structured data, right? So it, sure, it's JSON and you could think of, of, about it as a string, but really it's actually a way of having a structured data format, right? And so you can think about it as an equivalent of the XML from that perspective. Uh, because it's a known format, uh, it's all, you know, it, it behaves great in studio. We have syntax highlighting, code completion, as we just saw in that previous example. Uh, you can collapse easily sections to, to have a better uh, you know, uh, navigation into your code, et cetera, et cetera. And you got the fact that live literal works instantly. Uh, in fact, we, we also you know, prepared a guide that shows the mapping between XML, uh, the different XML attributes, and their JSON equivalent. That's particularly handy for motion layout that, and motion scenes that have a really large set of attributes and a large uh, a wealth of way of expressing motion. So it's, it's kind of nice if you want to, to better understand that mapping. Uh, we had talked actually last year uh, in, in the Chicago Robot Chicago about Link. So it's more like an exploration of a possible tool that you could create with this approach. So I won't go into too, too, too many details here. If you're interested, I would encourage you to check the, the link. But pretty much what the tool allows you to do is to edit uh, live uh, without, in fact, studio uh, and kind of acting as a super debugger or a super inspector. Uh, it's very much a prototype or a proof of concept, but it, it kind of shows the type of tools and the developer experience you can build when you are treating you know, this type of specification as pure data that you can manipulate. Um, so to recap, it's, it's really handy for us as a kind of a specification. Uh, it kind of address this whole separation of concern between your presentation layer and the rest of your business code. Um, provides better tooling in terms of live edit, et cetera. If you're interested in stuff like server-driven UI, um, at least part of that you kind of get for free because it's trivial to grab a JSON file from your server. And you know we're thinking as well about possible opportunities to, to kind of leverage real-time design session even something that you could do, you know, with a with a final application, not not something within the context of uh, you know your IDE. You could you could literally grab your your you know your a device, go sit uh, next to a designer, and you know uh, play with it together. So um, we talked a lot about JSON five, but really. We are obviously focusing as well on the Kotlin DSR. Kotlin brings uh, a different set of advantages, but it's kind of nice to have both worlds, right? So you can 
you're not stuck into one direction. You can actually pick the one that fits better what you are trying to achieve or what are your constraints as a developer. So the DSL is coming. Uh, I'm not going to show an example on screen simply because I'm a tease, but also because it's you know working progress. You can actually check the, the, the GitHub repository uh, if you're interested. There is like uh, some code being uh, already submitted. So it, it's starting to work, but we're still iterating on the shape of the API, which well, I'm, I'm a little cautious here in that side. But it's coming. Uh, let's go through some examples. So you can you can find a lot of these examples we are in um, our github repository and so it's a, i encourage you if you're interested in like seeing whatever we're doing what is the latest stuff we're building it's there it's in the system you can see you can see we actually uh typically record some little screenshots of them uh, and that you can click on the link and take you to the composable so you can sort of, if you see something like, how did they do that? You can click on it. You can figure out how it works um, in our system right now. Yeah, and there's a lot of them. So yeah, you should yeah. be able to find something that matches what you want to do. Yeah. Right. yeah. So okay, next. Yeah. Um, so so let, what are the things that, that motion layout has been used for in the past is to build up, build sort of simple custom components. You saw in the clock earlier where the, the swipe controller to, to snooze or, or, or cancel the alarm, that's a, a typical kind of custom component that would be built with motion layout. Um, and let's just walk you through an example, first doing it in XML, and then, uh, then doing it uh, in Compose. So in this case, we just have this like slightly goofy little spring animation. It has a little subtle effect where the, the ball rotates uh, as you uh, as you swipe it, and it has a bounce. So go next. So to to build that in 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 XML, first you would probably write a custom view in Java or Kotlin. That is the, the the drawing of the spring because it needs to kind of be able to to resize very dynamically in a specific fashion. Next, then you're probably going to make the ball with a shape drawable. Um, there are several different ways you might choose to do that. Um, then you would go and assemble them next. Uh, then you'll go assemble them in the um, uh, in a layout. Um, and typically convert that to motion layout. Then you'd go maybe tweaking the design in, 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 in the motion editor. You might then go to hand tweak some other things in the motion scene file. And then next. And then eventually you have the whole, the whole thing working, um, the, the two different scenes, the, the transition. And on the right, you see it interacts, right? Uh, um, now let's contrast that to if we do it in, in Compose. So in Compose, you'll just, you'll have a, it's all one file. You start off, you have your constraint sets. Um, in this case, you have a title. So we, in this one, we added a little title as well. Uh, <clears throat> and we use a custom attribute to drive the, the value of the title from, from zero to 99. Um, and then it, we also uh, have uh, the end section where we define a bunch of other stuff, um, start, end, and then we go into a transition. And in the transition, we define the unswipe where we make it a spring um, so that we actually build out that. And then right after that, you have your motion layout and you define the text for there. The canvas, you're directly going to draw the, the, the spring right there as a path. You draw the, the, the circle directly there with its own linear gradient. And notice, all, instead of four different files and all the different hopping between the different tech, um, pieces, you can build all of it in one, and you can run it in the editor right there. So in theory, you can sit there and type 153 lines of code and just get the answer, get it the effect working. And the nice thing about this version also is it's already a composable. 
which means you can easily use it in a different setting where we haven't even gotten into the how would you package a, a component in um, XML. So next. So here's another example. This is in the Compose Mail demo. You'll see it in our, in our GitHub. One of the key things here is we're using a lazy list, and each item is actually a mail item in this case. Um, and, um, and the mail item is, in fact, a, a, a motion layout. Uh, you see motion layout mail. Next. Uh, yeah, it's it's in fact a, a, a motion layout composable underneath. So all the animation between the different states of checked and not checked is all being done by uh, the motion layout inside of it. Next. Um, here's another part of that same app, and it, it's sort of cycling through different states of edit, um, and a, a draft and, and open. Um, and this is, again, just a motion layout with three different states. Um, we don't need to get into the details of how each of these is built. And if you want to see the example, the code's available um, in Compose Mail. Next. Yeah. I, and I would, I would add, generally speaking, that uh, where motion layout in Compose is, is specifically a great fit is when you have when you have like a finite amount of states uh, and you want to control carefully the transition between one state to another, because then it's, it's you know, it's, it's the closest you can get to what motion layout is, is really striving with. And, and, and it, it kind of like all works together really nicely. So let me talk about a slightly different example. Um, so this is a, just a, you know, uh, just a lazy row example uh, in Compose, pretty straightforward, uh, you know, just have a few cards, uh, that I'm using uh, the cards example is, is just like a data, uh, just a data class, uh, and and I'm drawing that in new card. I'm not showing the, the code for new card. It's, you can see it's really really easy. Just showing the text in the center, and I'm using the color from from that cards example uh, data class. So that's the typical uh, screen you you would get with Valeo. But what if you want to do a carousel, right? Uh, really, I would like something a bit more like that, uh, more something that's not actually an infinite, uh, you know, swipe and you go to the end. It's more like one one by one, and maybe I want something a little, you know, more interesting visually, where you know the card might rotate and expand a little bit. And you can build that relatively easily with motion layout in Compose. And there's a couple of interesting stuff here. Notice that I'm actually following the same pattern as uh, the that lazy row example. I'm just you know passing that my carousel and items list and passing the new card. So it is extremely succinct and you know it's very clear what's the intent of what you want to achieve here. And all the complexities is safely hidden into that my carousel uh, composable. And you'll see that the complexity is actually not even that crazy. But it's one of the biggest advantage I feel of Compose is this ease of use of building reusable components, right? The composables. And so in, in those situations, uh, it's it's a huge benefit compared to what we were doing in the view system where creating your own custom views or custom components was um, not that straightforward. So we have this carousel example in the view version of, of Constraint Layout. If you're interested, you know, check the link on, on GitHub, but you can do a lot of interesting stuff, right? And so how does that work? Um, pretty much, we try to define diff the different states that we are interested in. So if you want to if you want to carousel or carousel pattern, you want to cheat. Uh, as often in with computer graphics, uh, you you want to present the user like an infinite list, but really you don't have that many stuff on screen, right? So here in that example, I have a really super simple carousel, and I can make it work with just those three uh, those three views. And what I want to do is to have this kind of infinite list, right? And so what ends up happening when you're here is that Ideally, you want to kind of move back that previous item that was on the left, moving it back there so that you can continue and do that loop. And you can just you know, fake it by creating different constraint sets 
one for the start position where you see there are uh, uh, the, the elements outside of the screen, and two a state, one if you go forward and one if you go backward. And then motion layout can really just handle the rest. So this is kind of how it looks uh, in Compose, right? So you have this example here running, and pretty much I have this, you know, here this is just my data class encapsulating a, you know, some text, some colors, just, just to have something. Um, and, I'm, and I'm just creating this my carousel composable. And that my carousel composable pretty much define uh, the like a series of constraint set that I'm then passing to that motion carousel object. It's still work in progress. I'm still iterating a little bit on, on that particular API, but that's pretty close to I think where uh, we'll end up. Uh, where pretty much you just you know you just pass those different constraint sets. You can pass also some swap gesture if you're interested or not, and you know let motion carousel do the work. But you see the big advantage here with Compose is that. I can take that motion carousel, you know, kind of uh, piece of infrastructure uh, tool to build something and encapsulate it really nicely into my own object that I can then use in the rest of my code base. Um, and this is how the actual example then looks, right? I just call my carousel, pass it my items, and that's it. So um, you could actually go a little further than that. Um, one thing that's interesting is trying to take advantage of the definition of custom properties into the motion layout. You've seen those custom properties elsewhere. If, if you are using motion layout in the view system, you're probably familiar with them as well. But it's really easy to create a version of that uh, composable that uses those properties to do more interesting stuff. And here I'm just you know, tweaking the colors when when the center element is uh, when an element is not in the center, essentially, I, I use some you know, default color, and otherwise, I'm using the color passed in my data model. Um, and just a quick, uh, I, a quick show how it works. Uh, the actual interesting stuff here are just that I'm using the value of the properties, and then I do the whatever, right? So here, I'm going fancy with a gradient, but the really the, the interesting stuff here is just getting those properties. And you can see it really works really well. And I can just you know, uh, use all of that uh, you know, from the, and tweak them in the constraint set really easily without having to touch the rest of the code. Uh, it feels like we lost the, the screen. Yeah, this is interesting. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Um, uh, we might have some sort of weird technical difficulty on the other yeah, side. Okay, yeah, we're back. No, you're back. One. I think you hit next. Yeah, it's good. It's, yeah, we okay, have oh, oh, that's a okay. <laughs> Yeah, uh, okay, great. Um, so uh, that to just sort of wrap up on, on what we saw here, we saw a constraint layout in Compose. Um, it, it's 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 a rich it's rich layout. It has lots of com uh, lots and lots of different things. Everything that you've sort of uh, know and love from constraint layout is is there, and and we we're missing a couple of things in in terms of we don't have flow right now, um, and we're working on it. By uh, we uh, uh, my team, um, not Nicholas Slasher. Um, uh, uh, it um, it it helps with uh, layout separation, and 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 you can see from the the calculator example I was trying to show, you can have so many different layouts of the same set of widgets, and and how how are you going to manage that? How can you think about organizing it? That that kind of separation is 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 just generally useful in certain situations. Um, it, and when you add in the motion layout, it, it allows you to, to control animation between them in very complex, sophisticated ways. You saw that you can just switch between constraint sets with constraint layout and, and it'll animate. But if you wanted to actually control that animation with gestures um, and, and behavior during the animation, that's what motion layout brings to, to in Compose. Um, the other thing to... Um, to, to realize motion layout is it's still experimental. It's, it, it's so don't expect um, it to be like locked in stone today. We are working on it. Uh, it is a work in progress. Um, and, and 
for people who are used to constraint layout and motion layout in XML, you know that we're we're porting all our, our, our concepts and ideas and moving them across to to the composed version and trying to find a good fit and how it how they work well in the composed way. And 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 we're actually pretty pleased with where we are. Okay, next. Yeah. And uh, and I would add as well that one of the one of one of the key stuff that I feel motion layout is, is still like so so amazing with is when you're interested to do not just like a fire and forget transition, and obviously it does fire and forget transition very well because you can really customize the solution extremely, uh, but it's, it's in Compose as well, it's still about to evaluate those transition as you go, right? So it's easy to drive the transition from a gesture, for instance, or from progress, or et cetera, et cetera. It's not, it's not just I am transitioning to a state and that's it, you know? It's like you can actually be in the middle, which is kind of cool. Um, and we don't. Uh, for some reason, we don't have the screen. But but all this work is going on in GitHub. Um, oh, we have the screen. All this work is going on in, in in GitHub. You can look at the the libraries. You can look at our, our demos. You can see the link demo and how you would build something that was sort of remote controlling of a of a UI. Um, and all the examples in XML and in in uh, the Kotlin Compose uh, are there. Uh, and you'll find issues there. Um, uh, please give us feedback on anything, something you'd like to have, want to know, have any kind of question, um, use the, the, the tools of GitHub to, to, get, it, uh, to get it to us. Um, next. And don't forget, um, we're we're still building the the XML version. Uh, in fact, in the latest version, we have a, a tool called uh, a new helper called Grid, which gives us uh, uh, nested grids. And you can see a little picture of one there, um, which is really good for doing things like calculators. Uh, but if you set in the grid, if you set rows equal one, you have sort of the equivalent of row, and if you say set column equal one, you have the equivalent of a column. So it gives you nested rows and columns where they're abstracted in the layout, not in the um, uh, the actual hierarchy, which which makes it ideal for certain situations when you're you're going into compose. Um, it, this is only in XML now. It's sort of starting in XML, and then we are going to migrate it to Compose uh, soon, relatively soon. We're working on it, actually. Uh, so that's it. Um, we're at alpha 0.3. Um, and you, you can you can download it right now. And that's in the constraint layout, Compose no, views version is 2.2. Um, we do plan to eventually converge on one unified release of uh, one unified release number, but that's into the future. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Uh, and I don't know if uh, it, it would be if there's anybody who wants to ask any questions e e immediately. We'll be on the Slack channel. Um, and uh, I'm looking forward to hearing from people on with feedback on anything that they would like to say. Okay, I guess that's it.